Welcome. We are very excited to present an interview with Dr. George Siemens, the main proponent of connect connectivism, who answers some of our questions regarding the future of connectivism and learning theory. Before the interview, our group, which is myself, Sherry, Tony, and Su Tuan, would like to refresh your memory about the basic concepts of connectivism the context in which the th theory emerged and the implications and applications of the theory in teaching. Our preamble will cover the past and present so that Dr. Siemens can share his ideas regarding the future of connectivism learning theory. Our introduction will be brief so we can save most of the hour for Dr. Siemens. Now I'm going to hand it over to Su Tuan who will talk about some basic concepts of connectivism. Thank you, Sherry. Connectivism was proposed by Dr. George Simmons and Stephen Downs. The following are some basic concepts of connectivism. First, connectivism highlights the importance of sending networks. A network is a web containing nodes and connections. A node could be any entity, such as a person, a group of people, a computer, or fields, ideas, and communities. A connection is a link between two entities in a network. A change of state in the node may result in a change of state in the second node. These connections are representations of knowledge and understanding. The integrated whole of connections and nodes is the network. Connectivism argues that learning is distributed in a network. The bigger and richer the network, the greater the opportunity to learn. Connectivism emphasizes the learner's ability to navigate the information. The ability to synthesize and recognize the connections and patterns is a valuable skill. Content such as a magazine article is knowledge frozen at a certain time, whereas a connection is a pipeline that continues to flow new knowledge. The stronger the connections, the faster the information flow. The connectivists assert that the pipe is more important than the content within the pipe because the contents only exist temporarily. The fundamental principle of connectivism were integrated from chaos, network, complexity, and self-organization theories. Mary has elaborated these theories in her paper on connectivism. We won't repeat them today. Connectivism argues that knowledge is networked and distributed. Learning occurs in the creation and navigation of networks. Roughly speaking, the learning processes as connectivist theory are as the following. In the beginning, there are chaos and random initial connections. Organization begins to emerge from weak connections within networks. In the process of learning, weak ties begin the, uh, between the nodes in networks are strengthened. Gradually, the nature and organization of various types of information and knowledge are clarified and meaning are created. This is a process of pattern recognition. Then, learners connect the pattern to their own small words of previous knowledge and further expand their personal networks connect, connect to a greater degree with other nodes in order to learn more. Learning exploited the network patterns in the form of actionable knowledge. Now I'm going to turn over to Sherry. She's going to give us a metaphor. Thank you, Su Tuan. Um, one of the metaphors that was really important for um, understanding connectivism is uh, uh, the metaphor of um, 
uh, the of rhizomes. The metaphor of rhizomes to explain the growth of knowledge networks, particularly in cyberspace, came from the writing of uh, two French political philosophers, uh, Deleuze and Guattari. The connection to the work of Deleuze and Guattari itself demonstrates connectivism. Two completely or seemingly dis disparate worlds can find common ground, connections can be made, and new networks developed. Note the contrast between rhizomatic and arborist growth patterns captured in the quote. Unlike trees, rhizomes move and spread out in an uncontrolled pattern. We live in an age where fruitful connections and intercourse has occurred between heretofore dispar disparate fields like, for example, biology and engineering. Bioengineering would have been incomprehensible in another age. Connect back to Pat Fay's uh, assertion in Ada 1 that the truly fruitful advances in knowledge occur with connections beyond the knowledge bases associated with each field. That is the rhizome metaphor. Now, um, this slide talks about connectivism and epistemologies. Marcy Driscoll is, is well known in education because she specializes in learning theories. She connects learning theories to the discourses of philosophy, particularly um, epistemology. She has categorized epistemologies as objectivist, pragmatist, and interpretivist. Um, and she, uh, Siemens grasps onto um, Driscoll's nomenclature, his own um, epistemology of distributed knowledge. Um, he associates distributed, uh, the epistemology of distributed knowledge with the uh, learning theory connectivism. Now I will pass uh, back to Sue Tuan who will talk about the questions um, that need to be answered um, in terms of uh, whether or not a theory uh, qualifies as a learning theory. Thank you. Sue Tuan. Thank you, Sherry. There are two most frequently asked questions to connectivism. One is, is connectivism a learning theory? Another is, what are the differences between constructivism and connectivism? For the first question, Siemens provided his answers based on Xiang's five definitive questions. I list the here. Shank argued that any learning theory should provide answers for the following definitive questions. Number one, how does learning occur? Number two, which factors influence learning? Number three, what is the role of memory? Number four, how does transfer occur? Number five, what types of learning are best explained by the theory? Ertmer and Newby added two more questions to Shank's list. The two questions are, what basic assumptions or principles of the theory are relevant to instructional design? And and how should instruction be structured to facilitate learning? In the following three slides, we try to find the answer for these seven questions from literature and the practices of connectivists. People often confuse with the differences between constructivism and connectivism. These two theories seem to share several common concepts such as emphasis on dialogue and social interaction. This diagram was adopted from Dr. Simmons' article. Simmons, are, Simmons used this diagram to show that connectivism is able to answer all these five definitive questions well. Therefore, connectivism is definitely a learning theory. 
For your convenience, we have underlined some key words. You can gain a rough idea about the differences between constructivism and connectivism just by browsing over the underlined key words. Connectivism emphasizes networks, technologically enhance the environment, recognizing and interpreting patterns. The diversity in the network and strength of ties between nodes. Also, connectivism contains that meaning exists in networks rather than making sense by individuals. Connecting, connectivism also emphasizes the importance of connecting to nodes and growing the network, just not just socialization. Connectivism is best if used to explain the complex learning in the rapid changing world with diverse knowledge sources. In his article published in 2009, George Simmons did not answer directly to the question regarding the assumptions or principles for instructional design, nor did he answer the question about strategies for facilitating learning. We tried to find how connectivist theory converts to pedagogical practice by analyzing CCK09. CCK09 is an open course taught by George Simmons and Stephen Dong. The principle for instructional design based on connectivism appears to include providing the most diverse opportunities for learners to be able to connect with persons and ideas. Building the learner's ability to navigate the information. Adopting blogs, wikis, and other open collaborative platforms as two-way processes. Connecting to diverse outside real-world conferences and experts. Providing learning learners with rich array of tools and information sources to use in creating their own learning pathway using multiple forms of assessment. How does a connectivist teach? The learning activity Siemens and Dons demonstrated in their course include a brief introduction to weekly activities through a short podcast, paper, video, or online presentation. Moderating weekly discussions around readings inviting guest speakers to deliver short presentations in the, in the class, followed by discussion. They suggested that many-to-many -many works better than one-to-many. That means many instructors to many students works better than one instructor to many students when teaching a course. Providing daily emails summarizing key aspects of the existing conversation. Now I'm going to turn over to Tony. He's going to talk about the context in which connectivism emerged. Thank you, Shitun. So what is the context in which connectivism arrives? First, continue flow of data and information. According to the American Society of Training and Documentation, the amount of knowledge in the world has doubled between 1995 uh, and 2004. Believe it or not, it's now double every 18 months. So how do we cope with this knowledge explosion? Some of the knowledge we gain today was unknown in the past and may even be obsolete in the future. For semen, knowledge both increased and obsolete really rapidly. So in our present time frame, knowledge might may be linked to radioactivity. Seaman referred to this as half-life knowledge. So in this context, informal learning become more important than formal education. Knowledge is increasingly fluid, not only because of the rapidity of the increase in the volume of knowledge, but also because knowledge is continually changing. Second, what is the impact of technology on our way of life, communication, and learning? 
So in the last decade, technology, especially social media and Web 2.0 capability, allow learners to control content and even create their own content. In one of his articles published in 2008, Seaman looked at three main areas where information communication technology has impact learning. First, technology change ability to create and share information and content. Second, technology change ability to connect and dialogue with others. Third, technology change ability to experience a simulated reality. So uncertainty of lifetime and how this affected my career change. Well, we now have the possibility to move into a different or even unre unrelated careers over the course of a lifetime. Learning is a necessity. It's a continued process updated many times over a lifetime. Learning is combined with working activities and can occur in a variety of ways. On many occasions, people need to take action before they learn how to act. So the ability to learn about the unknown is more important than the ability to learn about the known. In other words, learning is an actionable knowledge. So under this setting, Seaman and Dance find that the existing learning theory, including behaviorism, connectivism, and constructivism, do not address this challenge. The big difference between connectivism and other learning theory is that the cognism actually explains the new knowledge creation. Next slide. Learning ecology. So what is a learning ecology? Seaman maintained that instead of designing instruction, we should focus on designing a learning ecology in which learner can forage for knowledge, formation, and meaning. So how do we define the term learning ecology? Seaman defined learning ecology as an environment that fosters and supports the formation of communities and networks. It's a dynamic, rich, and continuous ever-learning system. He viewed ecology as the space of learning and network as the structure of learning. In this diagram, he illustrated his idea of connectivism under the concept of constructivism. And this is a network. A network required nodes. All of these little dogs in color are nodes. That means it's an element that can be connected. And all of these nodes are connected with each other, it requires a connection. This is all connection. So what is a connection? It's any type of link between nodes, and this is the connection. So Seaman maintained that learning can occur in many places, format, and process, as indicated in all of these notes in the diagram. So in, a, in addition to formal education, learning can occur through games and simulation, mental link and apprenticeship, um, and also performing support and self-learning, formal and informal environment. And all of these nodes are connected together to form a learning network, resulting in knowledge transfer and effective learning. Once this network has been established, the flow of information can move from one domain to another. Now, the type of information, uh, the flow of information may include the following. Data, information, knowledge, and meaning. According to Seaman, learning is the act of encoding and organizing all of this node to facilitate the transfer of data, information, and knowledge. What about the learning process? The learning process is multidimensional including learning about, learning to be, learning to do, where, and learning to transfer. And Seaman maintained that the pipe or the conduit used to transfer this information may include language, either oral, written, and face-to-face, -face, media, TV, radio, technology, especially Web 2.0 technology, including Wiki, Bot, RSS feeds, social network, and email. Now, not all of the 
in this information are accepted or taken as it is. It's usually filtered by individual values, belief, perspective, and even their own experience. So what is the value of the network? Well, one of the value of the network is it is fully integrational. All of this node it does not work in isolates in isolation with each other, they're connected to each other. So another multi another uh, benefit is multi dimensional, as indicated by you know in this box dimension of learning. So what is our conclusion? Well, our conclusion are very much associated with incomplete or rough knowledge state of connectism as of today, November 21st, 2010. So we will interview with George Simon. We hope to focus on the connection between today and tomorrow as connectism and reach its node, expand its network, and map out its pedagogy more fully. Our concluding remark is that connectors and pitch connection make in network via emerging technology to support actionable knowledge and to accelerate a shift in education so that it is less hierarchical, more learning center, and more widely communicated and more far reaching. And this is probably like in the biggest contribution on connectism to learning. So we have prepared a list of uh, resources, including link to website and also video. And I'm going to pass it to Sherry. She's going to talk a little bit about our Apollon. Sherry. Thanks, Tony and Xi Tuan. I'm just going to wrap it up. Um, we decided to include an epilogue uh, because, of course, um, our products will go on and on um, as they are deposited in repositories um, and they will be searchable. Um, we, we're, of course, going to give the PowerPoint to the second EDI cohort. Um, there's a digital reading room available. There will be Illuminate recordings. Um, the PowerPoint will also be shared on SlideShare. So um, we believe that, the, that our presentation was put together using a connectivist learning theory frame of reference. Our resources were culled from our own personal learning ecologies. We use learning technologies for collaboration, like Google Docs and Google Sites, and of course, Illuminate. And we captured our learning in PDFs, PowerPoints, and recordings, and placed our products in repositories for the benefit of others to continue their learning. And with that, we, we bid you adieu. Thank you very much. So as a closing, stay tuned with our interview with George Seaman in the set part two of our project. Thank you. Um, um, we're part of the connectivism um, study group in 803 in the second doctoral uh, class for the ED, ED program. And we consist of Sue Tuan, Luli, myself, Sherry Oberman, and Tony Tin. Um, and we're just absolutely so thrilled to have George Siemens with us today to um, probe him a little bit more about um, the future of connectivism and also um, just to um, find out some answers to discrepancies or contradictions or problems that we noticed when we did our intensive study of it. So I would like now for Tony to um, to uh, ask George uh, the, the first question that we prepared. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Um, George, this is my first question to you. So you published like you know um, knowing knowledge, which is your first title to explain the concept in connectivism in 2006. So have your ideas changed much since 2006? So as a advocate of connectism, have you noticed if connectism has kept on with other academic around the globe? Or is the majority of the support for connectivism is still in Canada between yourself and Stephen? So can you 
elaborate on this, I'm going to give you the mic now, George. Sure. Well, there's a few questions loaded in there, so I'll try and address those bits and pieces. Um, the first one is, have your ideas changed much since 2006? Um, I wouldn't say the core ideas haven't changed. I mean, at that point, my argument was that fundamentally learning is the process of connection forming. And uh, I sort of detailed that in, in, well, provide a bit more detail on that in terms of the different contexts or the different levels at which it is connection forming. In some, so, so I think that's been one end, but the core concept of knowledge being a distributed phenomenon and learning being a process whereby we grow our uh, connections, uh, that hasn't been, no significant changes in that regard. One area though that I think, I'm not sure if the right word is militant, but I've become more convinced of is that in relation to other theories of learning, I believe the connection and forming, the connection based, the connectivist model is actually a more complete theory. And I think there's a reason for people to be somewhat irritated by that statement. But if you take a few minutes, and perhaps we'll get into this later, but if you look at the depth and the degree to which connections explain the learning process, right from uh, neuronal connections to even now as you get more information around networks and word usage, uh, and you recognize that really knowledge is about entity related and once you start looking at social networks, technological networks, fundamentally we're able to describe these from a connection-based model more effectively. Uh, for example, I recently had a dialogue with uh, someone uh, on Twitter actually is where it started and it carried over into other spaces, but where I asked an individual who's a very prominent pro uh, proponent of constructivism, I asked, you know, in a constructivist model, where does knowledge reside? And his response was, well, I don't know and I don't care. And so from my eyes, giving the, the prominence of neuroscience and the increased attention that's being paid to the biological basis of knowledge, I thought that was a rather uh, significant dismissal of this notion of uh, the biological substrate of learning. So broadly speaking, core views haven't changed. Secondly, uh, relates to your other question on the additional support or has it caught on with other academics. I, I guess it depends what your view of caught on is or, uh, you know, in terms of impact. I know there are numerous publications. I mean, the original book, Knowing Knowledge, has been translated into several languages. I'm familiar with Portuguese, Spanish, and Chinese as the main ones. Uh, I'm also familiar with uh, numerous journal articles, uh, some critical. Uh, for example, there's a Kopp and Hill article in Erodal recently. Uh, Plon Verhagen was, uh, who provided a very pointed critique of connectivism when I first wrote the article. Uh, there's others that have been more favorable in terms of support where it's been picked up uh, if you go to the well, the DE Hub out of Australia has a resource site. If you do a quick search on, on the DE Hub, you'll see a handful of resources of individuals that have either supported or disagreed with connectivism. By the same account, if you do a quick Google Scholar search, you'll also come across uh, numerous articles that uh, either support or disagree with it. So I think by and large, um, there's been a reasonable amount of activity in terms of uh, how it's being discussed, but again, <laughs> whether it's caught on, that's a second issue altogether. Thank you, G George. Um, now, uh, Sue Tuan will be, no, I'm sorry, uh, Su yes, now Sue Tuan will be um, asking you another question. Thank you. Hi, George. This is Su Tuan. Uh, last month, you said at the Open Access Week at Athabasca University that a model of design pedagogy delivery and assessment is emerging for connectivism. You then introduced the one-click open course which presents delivery for us, I suppose, and the forum for inter-instructional collaboration, which we consider instructional design, and uh, uh, learning analytics, which we take as a connectivist equivalent to assessment in the old paradigm. Have you and your team come out with a more specific pedagogy that would guide educators in planning teaching or designers in planning instruction. Thank you.
Uh, yeah, there, there are a few things that we're starting on. Uh, first of all, there's recent uh, SHIRT grant that uh, we were awarded as part of it. It was the Knowledge Synthesis or Digital Economy Grant Series through, uh, that was uh, that, that's being funded by SHIRT. And one of the focus points or the main focus is how does knowledge develop and grow in a, a MOOC, a massive open online course. So we're certainly looking at what are the implications from a learning and a knowledge perspective. And we just wrapped up a course called Personal Learning Environments, Networks, and Knowledge, which uh, finished this last week. And we have, I believe, four particular research projects that are coming uh, as a result or that are being focused on with that particular proposal. Uh, some are being done by researchers at the National Research Council. Uh, there's one individual from a university, I believe it's in Sydney, and as well a SHIRK group that uh, for, from University of Prince Edward Island. So uh, there's a fair bit of activity around the, the notion of what a MOOC is. So I should mention as well another one with uh, Wendy Drexler and uh, Chris Seasoms from uh, University of Florida. So there's growing interest at least with a subset. I don't know how big the impact will be around what exactly teaching and learning looks like in a connectivist type of course. Now there's a few things that are weakness, so I just want to emphasize that first. First of all, we do have a significant concern around trying to create a model that can be deployed and communicated fairly easily. A common complaint that I hear is individuals will state, well, you know, I, I, I'm trying to understand what connectivism is, but it doesn't make sense to me and I, I'm not wrapping my head around it. Which by providing individuals an experience to take a course such as a MOOC or a similar design, would suggest that they'd have a better understanding of exactly what that type of course means from a design and a teaching perspective. However, and this is a critical challenge, you know, size matters in these kinds of environments. We've been quite successful with large courses where we've had anywhere from, you know, 750 to 22, 2300 students involved. But the question is, what does it look like if you run it with a group of 15 or 20 students? And I ran one course at Athabasca earlier this year called Teaching and Learning and Social and Technological Networks where I took the same approach. And the outcome of this approach was much like the large course, which is a fair degree of initial confusion, discomfort with the disconnectedness of the process. Uh, so there are certainly issues that, uh, that still exist around it and that need to be addressed. Uh, issues of perhaps uh, lack of student participation, uh, planning from a system level. I mean, it's one thing to treat something as a research project. It's quite another to be able to take that and roll it out for, let's say, an institutional level design model or a program-wide design model. And so I think those are a few things that, that need to be asked and answered in order for a broader adoption to come out as a result of it. Now, in fairness, I'm seeing a few things that are very much in our favor in that regard such as the growth of social media, social networks, uh, increased attention to uh, better data collection around the learning process, a term we've uh, come to describe more so as learning and knowledge analytics. So I think we're getting a better sense of specific pedagogical methods that can be utilized. In fairness, as with any good ideas, parts of these have a longer legacy. And if you look at some of the early literature around openness in distance education, even going back to the founding of Open University, uh, there's a good amount of pedagogical guidance that can help educators with the process as well. What it looks like in a technological environment, though, those are still very much up for grabs in terms of deciding what are those critical components and how are they needed. Now. In, from one perspective, I'm reminded a little bit of initial discussions in the late 90s around communities of practice. With, as the technological environments became more pronounced, we needed to develop a whole sequence of language and terms around what does it mean to participate in a community and the responsibility and the roles of people in a community. I think we'll start to see a similar trend developing around networks in teaching and learning. And definitely there are a lot of conference and conference activities now and journal articles that are focusing on exactly this topic in terms of networks and social networks for learning. Uh, the bigger question is whether they take that broader leap that Stephen and I have done with connectivism and begin to emphasize the integrated nature of learning and knowledge, uh, both being fundamentally networked and orientation. Thank you, Josh. 
It sounds very exciting. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm planning to enroll in CCK 11. Okay. Now I will uh, turn the mic to Sherry, who will introduce the next question. Thanks, Sue Tuan. And I think, yeah, it would be a great idea for me to also enroll in that course so you and I could be together again in another course. Yeah, I, I wonder what it'd feel like to be in a connectivist kind of course. I think it would be quite different than, um, than a course in a, uh, an L LMS. Um, and so that sort of segues into our next question, which is one of coherence and control. Um, in the same presentation at the Open Access Week at AU um, in October 2010, uh, you mentioned about the patterns of participation observed in the open course that you and Stephen Downs taught, uh, CCK08, CCK09, and Plan 10. You said that there was a significant fall in participation between weeks three and four, which did not recover for the rest of the course. You believe that this was because the learners had experienced frustration at that time. They felt that there was too much information. They could not handle so much content. They were unsure about the goals of learning, etc., uh, which you talked about in your answer to the last question. Um, you also talked about a bounded course. Also in your new book, Handbook of Emerging Technology for Learning, you have a, a section that discusses coherence. Coherence sounds like there is a need for control over the learning processes. Um, putting, this all, all, putting all the thoughts together relating to the preamble, will you say that cert a certain level of instructor control is helpful for effective learning? Or do you think external and or internal controls emerge as students work their way through a course? How or where can the learners learn who to follow, which course concepts are important, and how to form sub-networks and subsystems to assist in sense making, which are required to respond to information abundance, as you described in your recent blog post? Thanks, George. OK, well, that, that's uh, there's some good points there. And, and I certainly want to pick out each of those. So I'll apologize in advance for uh, a bit of a longer response. First of all, the courses that we've done, open courses, show a very specific pattern of engagement on the part of students. And I've known this to be the case in all of the open courses we've run, again, running from you know, 750 to over 2,000 students. I've also found this with smaller courses, uh, such as the one I did at Athabasca, where the teaching and learning and social and technological networks. We had a very similar pattern of interaction. And whether that drop off that doesn't rebound, I mean, there's several reasons for it, potentially. Uh, and it's hard to gauge exactly what they are. We don't understand that yet. On the one hand, we have, especially in this last course that we did, we had consistent increase in participants joining the course. I think when we started the course, I, I'd have to go check my exact numbers, but I thought we were around 11, 1,200 participants. When we concluded the course, we had 1,600. And by that, I mean 1,600 people who had signed up for the daily, which which meant they receive five emails a day from us related to the course. It's very easy for someone to unsubscribe from the email. You click the link at the bottom, and you're, you don't receive the email anymore. So I'm assuming there is some reason for people to be involved in, in these courses, even if they're not posting in the discussion forums. So that could be one potential reason, is that they're participating in spaces that we aren't defining. Uh, it could also be that their approach to learning is different than perhaps what we expect. Uh, I'm a big believer in the need for creation. People need to create an artifact so it can serve to as a repurposing, uh, uh, repurposing for additional discussions. Uh, however, that's not always the case, uh, as a lot of individuals prefer to sort of learn uh, and, I guess, absorb information without contributing back. Another part that could be a problem is that uh, perhaps we don't have the right pedagogical model. Uh, you know, maybe we need to be more direct in our interventions, especially as the course progresses. In the past, I've always felt we, uh, you know, start with a degree of support early in the course, but as the course progresses, you diminish your involvement as the the network and the community begin to take over and advance the conversation. Uh, perhaps in a large open course like this, that's not the best approach. Maybe we should revert that somewhat and put more effort in uh, as the course progresses rather than less so as the course progresses. So again, I'm not quite sure what that means. 
Another end of it could be that the topics are less interesting. You know, perhaps when a course begins, if it's an open course, people aren't forced to be there. They can come and go as they want. And uh, as a, the, the course advances, it may be that our topics aren't as interesting to them. Maybe it's that the topics we're tackling require an integrated approach, which means you know they, they scaffold and build on each other. So by the end of the course, they're not as involved as they were at the start because they haven't sort of followed the activity or their contributions haven't been consistent. So a lot of these things, basically what I'm saying is we know there's a pattern of user participation that decreases. Uh, we don't know why, and I at least certainly don't know what it means uh, and how much it's tied to students taking the conversation in other spaces. So I think that takes care of the, the, the first block of your question, basically by me saying I don't know, but it's a topic that needs more exploration. Uh, this is particularly uh, hit home for me in the current offering of the course uh, when we, we did the plank uh, that we just lapped up, uh, wrapped up now. And these, these usage patterns on the part of the individual participants, you know, would it be different if they were only enrolled students? If I did a course with uh, 100 students and all of them paid and required grading for their work, would we see different levels of participation? And that's certainly worth exploring because when we had the open course, the first one we did at University of Manitoba, we had just over uh, 20, or we had 25, in total 25 students enrolled. And the outcome of that was there was reasonably consistent participation from them. The ones that weren't enrolled, there was a different level. So these are, again, a lot of questions that we don't quite know the answer to, but I think is, a, is the start of what could be a potentially uh, interesting uh, research agenda if open courses continue to develop. Now, in, you also ask uh, about um, coherence. And you know, coherence, I don't know, I don't know if I would quite say coherence requires a need for control over the learning process. I would say that coherence is what's required to understand a topic. If I want to understand a topic well, then I think it's important that I have an integrated view of that topic. I understand how different elements influence that topic. So when I talk coherence, I'm essentially referring to the quality and the nature of the connections that learners have. Ideally, you don't want too much incoherence where you're, you, you hold too many contradicting perspectives that you're not capable of clearly describing a particular phenomenon or a particular activity. So um, I think that's something that's worth looking at in more detail. However, I will say that I certainly don't have an issue with a certain degree of control. I mean, context is everything. Uh, we're always making choices for our students or for ourselves that relate to control. And then you use the term, uh, you know, external, internal control. Uh, to some degree, you require from an educator a degree of structure and assistance. You know, these are some of our readings. These are discussion topics that we're going to have. These are the things we're going to talk about this week. So the instructor does play that role in framing part of the conversation. Now, as students get involved and as they move forward a little bit, they spend a bit more time digging into the ways in which systems self-organize. And this is why I mentioned earlier the value of creation. You know, if you create an artifact or a resource, it changes the flow of the discussion. You know, in a sense, ideas are energy. And so if someone throws out a new idea, people sort of gather around it and start to interact and debate that concept. So in that regard, uh, definitely there is uh, emergent control that emerges by the artifacts that people create and by the way that they engage and interact with each other. Uh, by the same account, a university or a college has a need for external control specifically related to evaluation. If it's not effective evaluation and if they can't demonstrate a certain quality of learning occurred with the students, then of course it will reduce the value of a degree or a certificate or a diploma that comes from that institution. So there does need to be some control at certain points in the course. A fully open, free course without any starting point is difficult to do with a large, diverse group. So, I mean, it's something to focus on as well. I've done it in the past with a group of about 20 people that were, you know, fairly similar, all basically in higher education. And the course started off with an assumption that learning content isn't always needed before a course starts. Sometimes the learning content is created by the activities of individuals in the course. So with a group of about 20-some educators, I'd send out an email question at the start of the week 
discussion would ensue, and then by the end of the week, I would produce an article based on the resources shared and on the discussion. But even then, there was that initial question as a point of control that guided the discussion. So I think at some level, you can't escape uh, control because you do move into chaos, which is not the ideal place for learning. Now, uh, in your final point, uh, which is you know, how or where can learners learn who to follow and the sub-networks to form, I think that's a skill that an educator certainly plays a role in. I mean, an educator should be able to provide some direction and some guidance to students and, uh, and lead them in areas that perhaps aren't as concise, uh, concisely understood by a network. So the educator models those practices of following. Uh, I think the network can also help people to decide who to follow and what to follow. Uh, if we're somewhat developed in our competence in a field, we'll know a reasonably good idea or a unique idea as we become familiar with it. So I think a combination of instructor modeling and guidance, an explicit focus on what are effective learning networks, and just the value of students and, and learners uh, developing competence as they interact around ideas will help them improve their own networks in terms of, uh, or, or subsystems that they need to make in order to get a hold of these different topics from their own context. Because really a sub-network and a subsystem is a context forming structure. It helps to create a, a particular way in which to think about a topic in a particular context. Thanks, George. That was a really in-depth and um, illuminating answer um, to this question. I, I learned a few things about coherence and control that I, I didn't know um, in my thoughts about connectivism. Um, I'm going to now pass uh, the next question to Sue Tuan. And um, thank you very much for, for answering that so, so in such a detailed way. Okay. Uh, it seems that you have answered uh, uh, part of this question, but uh, I thought you might like to uh, to to come on a little bit further on the question about the control. In some circumstances, although the instructors do not try to control the learning progress and discussion, it is not rare to find that some more active students will dominate the group's conclusion, and that uh, conclusion might be very wrong, for example, wrong about a fact. Shall we just let it be like that and let the learners learn through a natural process by themselves? as you said in Robin Good's interview in 2008. Learners have to experience the chaos before they can learn how to deal with that. Thank you. Sure, no, I, I'll definitely go into a little bit more detail on, on the control dimension. Um, it's worth emphasizing that inability to understand something or to get facts wrong is not a function of the instructional method, whether that's controlled by heavy lecturing or controlled by individuals learning through social networks. Lack of understanding is a function of uh, poor coherence between different concepts and ideas. Uh, so I'll give you an illustration of what I mean by that. There was uh, a report, and I say this in previous forms, so you may be familiar with this, but there was a, a private universe was the name of this report that was done where a group of educators or, or uh, researchers at least talked to grads from a Harvard uh, program. And these, this was on graduation day, and they asked them a simple question about why do we have seasons. And surprisingly, the vast majority uh, of the students were, the, these grads, the most elite university in the world, the vast majority were unable to answer this question correctly. So you know, these are people who had gone through a very instructivist type model. Uh, you know, Harvard does have obviously lower faculty or student to faculty ratios than many other uh, universities would. So there were a lot of opportunities for students to interact around these ideas. But even then, even though they were in the space of some of the leading thinkers in the world, they still got this very fundamental fact about why we have seasons wrong. So again, I want to emphasize that it's not the form of teaching that produces errors. It's the form of student learning and lack of coherence that introduces errors. So if, for example, 
I'm taking a course, and this is something that we both, uh, you know, Carl uh, Breider and the Marlene Scardamalia have addressed in their work around knowledge making. It we're, we're constantly forming ideas and hypotheses about different phenomena. Now, in some cases, it could be just looby ideas, you know, such as we, we need to start wearing tinfoil hats. But in other cases, you know, we're always we're creating ideas or hypotheses and we're testing them. And then the evidence in the world influences the way in which that idea is tested. Now, in a lot of cases, this testing happens exclusively within our head, you know, much like uh, Vygotsky and, and Wittgenstein actually looked at how language gives birth to ideas. So if we're learning in a passive way, we aren't able to test our theories as much as if we learn in more of an, a, a, an open, sort of transparent way. So if I'm sitting there in a classroom and I'm listening to someone talking about the change in seasons and they're delivering a great lecture and I'm taking notes because I know I'm going to have to pass that test, if at no point I'm required to offer my theory and then to have that theory interrogated by either the instructor or by other people in the social network, then I can labor under a false hypothesis that has not provided me with conflicting data on that hypothesis because I haven't made it explicit and external, then I, that, that may never be challenged. So again, for the third time, just to reiterate, it's not the instructional method, or the, but it's the, the, the lack of coherence in the learner's connection between ideas and concepts that de determines significant substantial errors. So it is a responsibility, I think, of teachers and instructional designers to surface the hypothesis or the ideas that students are forming through a course. Now, there's various ways you can do this. In my eyes, you need to be an active learner. You need to share your ideas. You need to discuss with others. And people will correct, in some cases, self-correct each other. In other cases, an instructor needs to step in if they find out that something is blatantly wrong. If a student offers a view of a, a situation or a topic where the research at that point clearly shows that's an erroneous view, then, and, and if none of the other students correct that individual learner, then it's the instructor's responsibility to jump in and provide a counter perspective and obviously support it with research. Um, this is a good opportunity, and this fits sort of in the cognitive apprenticeship model that, uh, that Collins and Brown, I believe, have, have written about a reasonable degree. Uh, which is you model the kind of behavior that you want students to exhibit. So if you find errors aren't being corrected, then the instructor needs to step in and provide a or model a, an error correcting process, whether it's through uh, in-depth questioning of the student, whether it's through providing additional resources or pointing to uh, additional or existing research. So those are all ways in which we can ensure that there is critical thought being put into the ideas that we're developing and that our ideas have a degree of coherence across, uh, really across the whole network so that there are you know, blatant contradictions are either surfaced and accepted as contradictions or as current unknowns or they're corrected in the process. Now, I do think that instructors need to engage learners in the knowledge forming process. I mean, in my mind, imparting knowledge uh, doesn't mean anything. It's, it's a term that just doesn't happen. I mean, there's no way that uh, you can impart your knowledge to me. Uh, you can say some things and you can discuss a few ideas and if I if your ideas resonate with me and with my existing understanding, then I'll form new knowledge connections, but in the sense that, that I'm duplicating the image of knowledge in your head, in my head, uh, that's simply not true. Learning doesn't work that way. But definitely the connections that you create in me might cause some ideas to trigger and advance and eventually there'll be some harmony or some resonance between our two views of world or views of knowledge. Now, in terms of the Robin Good interview, I think it's important to emphasize that, yes, you know, we do experience chaos in our lives and in some cases, you know, the process of, of coming out of complex environments and understanding the world better, it comes through the frictions that we have to deal with in those complex spaces. So how we make sense of difficult settings, what we decide to pay attention to, you know, what we decide to ignore, uh, what we decide to move away from, I mean, these are all uh, critical parts of the learning process. And sometimes we can get it absolutely right, and other times uh, we can be completely wrong. In some cases, 
uh, an assertion that we make today or as we try to make sense of the world. Uh, it may seem ludicrous and there's numerous examples of this where uh, early innovators were rejected by the existing scientific community. You know, Paul Bakhirita's original work around you know, how the brain works and his view that it's the brain that sees, not the eye, uh, was initially rejected because it didn't fit in with the existing views of the human brain. Since then, he's proven to be right. And at that point, he couldn't even get his article published because people felt it was a ludicrous idea. So sometimes we have to be careful. You know, what's the line between something that's an error versus something that we just don't know the answer to yet and a really innovative idea may actually prove in the long run to be truthful. In another case, a really innovative idea could be completely wrong. So I think that's why there's a need to recognize that this process of making sense of complex phenomena uh, does take a period of time. And in some cases, the research and the evidence can be quite clear. And in other cases, we need to recognize that we really have to suspend our views on it and wait for uh, more or better information to emerge. Thank you, George, for the very uh, uh, thoughtful and expansive answer to my question. When I trust back to CCK 0809 and uh, Plan 10, oh, I, I didn't see Plan 10, sorry. I found that there was great, uh, huge workload for teachers. And this is something I found the, the first point. The second point is I found that the course are uh, were very familiar with uh, the one, uh, very similar to the one we are taking now. So are we connected with them? I don't know. Uh, it's not a question. So I will hand it back to um, Sherry for the next question. Thanks, Sue Tuan. I, I appreciate that. And um, George, you are really stimulating me, um, you know, in listening to your answer to this question on criticality, coherence, and control. I was just thinking probably when you came up with the idea of connectivism, you had to go through the same process that a lot of people um, who, a lot of scientists or, or theorists go through in the sense that, um, they're always like discredited and torn down and you know it, ta it takes a while it, and I think we're still in the, the lack of coherence let's say or the lack of acceptance for connectivism stage. It hasn't been established and you're fighting that battle and it's, it's an exciting one to fight. But anyways enough about that. I'll get on to the next question. Um, yeah, we're looking at social inequities. Um, diversity plus freedom of choice equals inequality. And the greater the diversity, the more extreme the inequality. Uh, is an observation that was made in an article from Clay Shirley. Um, how do these discussions arouse your thoughts about the amplification of social inequities which would result through the application of connectivist theory? Thanks. It's an, it's an interesting point uh, that you're raising there and uh, I will say personally I'm not a huge fan of, of Clay Shirky. I know others and colleagues certainly are but uh, so I just... Results of the application of connectors theory. It's an, it's an interesting point. I'm not a fan of certainly are. the application it's an, it's an interesting point of raising the and of I will of I am not a of fan of of a shirky of and of certainly are of of result of the application of connector theory. It's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the Kennedy Shirky, the Kennedy's and the Kennedy certainly are the Kennedy. The result, the Kennedy application, the Kennedy connect theory. 
it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are but the result the application of connected theory it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are but the result the application of connected theory It's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. But the result, the application of connected theory. But it's, an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's, an, it's an interesting point. And, uh, I'm not a huge fan of the result, the application of connected theory. It's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's, an, but it's an interesting point. Raising the band. I will say I'm not a big fan of the connected shirky connectors and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a huge fan of the shirky and certainly are. The, the result, the application of connected theory. It's an, it's an interesting point uh, 
raising and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of research and clearly result result yeah connect yeah connect What's an annoying interest in raising, raising, and, raising uh, I will say I'm not a shirky fan of and clearly off. Result, result, yeah, connect, yeah, connect, eerie, eerie. What's an annoying interest in raising, raising, I will say I'm not a shirky fan of raising, and clearly off. Result, the application of connect, eerie. What's an it's an interesting point, raising and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. It's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. The result, the application, the connect, the theory, the connect. It's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of the shirky and certainly are. Result, the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point, raising, and uh, I will say I'm not a shirky and are. Result, the application of connect theory. But 
it's an it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connected theory It's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, connect raising and uh, connect I will connect personally I'm not a huge fan of the connect research the connectors and Certainly are the connect the connect result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the result theory. connect theory. Connect it's an interesting raising, raising. I will find that I am not a I am not a user and cut. Certainly are. Result, the result, theory, connect, theory, connect. It's an interesting raising, raising. I will find that I am not a I am not a user and cut. Certainly are. The result, the application of connect, theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising and uh, I will personally I'm not a huge fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connect theory. 
But it's an, it's an interesting point, uh, raising the and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising the and um, I will say I'm not a fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising the and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising the and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of research years and certainly are the result the application of connected theory. But it's an, it's an interesting point uh, raising the and uh, I will say I'm not a fan of research years and certainly are the but result the connect the application the connect 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 the conn